two of a series called The Keys to Authority. And if you were not able to be here last week, I would encourage you, I know I say this frequently, but I would really encourage you to go and watch the message online because uh, I feel like it was a game changer, and I feel like we had a lot of people that gave us a lot of good feedback on that. And so um, if you weren't here, uh, go online and and check that out. And the reason why we're doing Keys to Authority, because we we gave you a, a chance to vote on what the next series was, is that you voted on authority. And so if you don't like this series, it's your fault. Completely. No, uh, it, it was a good kickoff last week, and we'll do a few more weeks on this. And uh, wanted to say this, though, just like these keys that I have in my hand, these keys give you uh, access. They give you permission. If I toss these keys to you, they are now your responsibility. They give you opportunity. Uh, and, and whatever you have a key to, you have access to. You are permitted to. You are sanctioned to. But anytime you see the word key in the Bible, it really means authority. Everybody say authority. Okay, say it with authority. There you go. So anytime you see key in the Bible, it's talking about authority. And so Jesus actually said this. He said, I give you the keys or the authority to operate the kingdom. He gave it to us, the church. And and it goes on, it says this, if it's locked up in heaven, we can lock it up on earth. If it's loosed in heaven, we can loose it on earth. And so uh, we, we began learning about last week, one of the keys to authority we learned last week was position. And I believe this helps so many people that you are not on the same playing field as the devil. A lot of people think that. We've seen the cartoons, little devil, little angel, and they're on the same playing field. Um, The Bible says we're seated with Christ in heavenly places, which means this. Whatever's under the feet of Jesus is actually under your feet. And we made a bold statement that you have the same authority that Jesus has. Thank you for the... Two people that believe that. You have the same authority that Jesus has. And so whatever's under the feet of Jesus is under your feet. And so that's why Jesus said you have the keys to the kingdom. And we learned this last week. Our, our first key of authority is position. And we said this, that authority is really delegated power. So Jesus delegated all of his power to what? Us, the church. He delegated to us. But we said this about authority, that authority is not about feeling. It's about knowing. You don't have to feel like you have authority to have authority. You know you have authority. And then we said this, that it's exercised by faith. And then we gave you some reasons why your, your authority can be inoperative. You don't lose it, but it could, it could be inoperative. Now, I don't have time to go into that. That's why you need to watch it online. But Jesus also said this in the book of Luke. He, he said that I give you the ability to exercise authority over the devil's power. Actually, most translations say this. They say, I give you power over the devil's power. But that's not what it says. It says, I give you the ability to exercise authority over power. See, authority is greater than power. Are you with me? Because you have authority over a power. A policeman can't stop that speeding car, but he can go like this and change traffic. Why? Because he has authority to do so. So we learned about the whole key of positioning last week. And so I want to start off today, and I feel like this is going to really, really help you. And I'm going to make a statement, and it may seem a little different, but here's the statement. It's not always the devil that we have to gain authority over. Let it sink in for a moment. It's not always the devil that we have to exercise our, our authority over. Uh, let, me, let me teach you a principle that I haven't taught for a while and make it make sense, and we're going to dive into this today. Y'all doing all right? Okay. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 says this. I pray that God, who gives peace, will make you completely holy and may your spirit, everybody say spirit, soul, and body be kept healthy and faultless until Jesus returns. So the Bible is talking about three distinct dimensions, the spirit, the soul, and the body. And he says this, this is said again over in Hebrews. What God has said isn't only alive, but it's active. So whatever Jesus has said, it's alive and it's active. Anyone believe that? It's actually sharper than a two-edged sword. Look what it says. His word can cut through spirit, soul, and it says joints and marrow, but that's what? That's body. So the word cuts through that until it discovers the desires and thoughts of our hearts. So what Scripture is teaching us is that all of us, are made up of three dimensions, the spirit, the soul, and the body. 
let me put that in perspective. The spirit is the part of you when you became a Christian or born again. That's the eternal part of you. And that part was immediately and completely changed. There are no defects in your spirit if you've been born again. But you also have a soul. Now, a lot of people, when they preach, they'll use soul and spirit kind of interchangeable. But really, the Bible teaches us that there's spirit and there's soul. Soul is when the Bible talks about your heart. So it's talking about a heart of a person. That's where your mind, your will, and your emotions reside. And then the Bible talks about your body. Now, your, uh, well, first, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says this, that you are a brand new what? Creation. The old has gone away, and behold, all things are new. What that means is the inside man, the inward man, the spiritual man, the spirit is brand new. It's a brand new creation. But it doesn't tell us that the outward man was changed. So if you were blonde before you were born again, you were blonde afterwards, unless you chemically enhanced and made change, right? So if you were six foot four when you were saved, guess what? You're six foot four afterwards, right? So these things that are in our soul and our body didn't change, but your spirit changed. It's important for us to know and for us to get that principle. So your, your soul is for your spirit your, or where your mind, your will, and your emotions are. So the outward man, the Bible said, is actually decaying. But the inward man is to grow stronger. But I want to focus this morning on the part the Bible talks about the soul. And I want to share... Uh, a key with you today with authority. But I was thinking about this a few years ago. It was in the morning, and I walked out to my truck. And as I approached my truck, I could tell that something looked a little different. I could see that the seat was flipped up. And I thought, I don't remember doing that. And as I got to the driver's side, the door was ajar. And I opened the door very slowly. And when I looked in my truck, whatever was in my glove box was all over my truck. And whatever was in the console of my armrest was all over the truck. Someone had broken in during the night and just ransacked my truck. All they really stole was some loose dollars I had in the cup holder. And there were some CDs everywhere at that time. We did CDs. This was a few years ago. And they were mostly Christian CDs, so they didn't want those. So they, they, they just ransacked my truck. And I remember thinking at first I felt violated. And then I started to get really angry that someone had the nerve during the night to break into my truck. And then I wondered, how did they break into my truck? And I realized the door was unlocked. So all of a sudden, my anger turned to, well, it's not really their fault. I was the irresponsible one that left the vehicle unlocked. And I wonder how many times, in a spiritual sense, we're irresponsible. And there are some things we leave open or some things we leave unlocked. So if the devil's under our feet, why is it sometimes we feel like we don't have authority over him? And so I want to talk about a second key today, and that's what I would call the key of responsibility. The key of responsibility. Not heard a lot about responsibility, right? Um, when it comes to authority, it's not something that you have to gain from God. It's something he gives you. He said, I give you the keys. I give you the authority. And so sometimes we're praying and wanting something to happen that God's already provided for you. But really the responsibility for us is to have revelation and to stand and to enforce and to exercise the authority that he gave us. He said, I give you the ability to exercise authority over the power of the devil. But in this, this realm of the soul, which just let me say it this way, it's our thinking we need to be responsible because we can leave open access to the devil in the area of our thinking. So as I studied out some scripture, I find that there are three things the Bible actually tells us to do with our bodies. And I want to focus on one of those today. And, and so the first thing we are to do is we're responsible to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. So one of the things you and I are called to do with our lives is to, to it means to yield or to offer. We're to offer or to yield or to lay down our lives, not as a once dead sacrifice, but what? As an ongoing daily, what kind of sacrifice? Living so our authority comes as we're continuing to yield. Whatever God said, whatever God desires, whatever God wants of us, we're just to yield to those things. So if God calls you to be a champion, guess what you need to yield to? Uh, the answer is champion. Did y'all get that? <laughs> if God calls you a conqueror, what should you yield to? 
you're a conqueror. If, if, God's, uh, uh, if he's called you to be healed, what should you yield yourself to? Right? So we, we just, we're yielding ourselves to the work of Jesus. And so what we're responsible to is to continue to offer our lives in obedience as a living sacrifice. Look at Romans chapter 12. I, I know you know this verse, but look what it says here. Dear friends, I love this. I love this translation. It says, dear friends, God is Let's say that like you believe it. Dear friends, God is good. He's good. So I beg you, because he's good, offer your bodies to him as a living sacrifice that's pure and it's pleasing. That's the most, I love it, the most sensible way to serve God. What's the most sensible way to serve God? You keep offering your life, your mind, your heart, your family as a sacrifice, yielding it to God's promises. Verse 2 says, so don't be like the people in this world, but let God change the way you. So let God change the way you. Then you'll know how to do everything that's good and pleasing. Other translations say this. Um, it says to offer your lives as a sacrifice and let your mind be renewed or be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Let it be transformed, the Bible says. It's the word metamorphosis. It's the word we get where a, a, a caterpillar goes into a cocoon and comes out a butterfly. In other words, there's a process of God changing our stinking thinking. And the Bible says as that happens, we will come to understand the good the acceptable and the perfect and pleasing will of God. So you want to know how to know the will of God and walk in the will of God? It starts with what? Getting our stinking thinking changed. Anyone ever have stinking thinking? So you got saved. You're on your way to heaven. Your spirit man, your spirit man's not in the, there's nothing in your spirit man that's an addict. There's nothing in your spirit man that's sick. There's nothing in your spirit man that's depressed. There's nothing in your spirit man that's suicidal. There's nothing in your spirit man that's sinful. But how many know some of that stuff's in our thinking? It's in our mind. It's in our will. It's in our emotions. So when you got saved and you got born again, um, it, wasn't a, it, it caused emotion, but it wasn't an emotional thing. It wasn't a physical thing. It was a deep spiritual thing. And so let's make some points about this. But we're responsible, right, for our thinking. So, so number one, or letter A, the devil thrives when you are irresponsible. So the devil can thrive in the life of a believer if he is irresponsible. Responsible. You say, well, irresponsible with, with what? We're responsible to do something with our thinking. They say that you think twenty to 30,000 thoughts a day. What are you doing with all those thoughts? Because I make you a guarantee that your life is moving in the direction of what you've thought about the most. Or what you've felt the most. Um, every feeling that you have is real but it doesn't make it right. Have you ever been so mad you could hurt somebody? Okay, not you spiritual ones, but the rest of us. Come on, someone did you wrong, they did some injustice to you, and you were so angry? Was the feeling real? Yes. Did it make it right? No. But some people, because they, you know, as an unbeliever, you have no spiritual change on the inside. So you have no ability have a renewed mind. That's why we see things happen like we just saw in Vegas. A depraved mind doing crazy things. And I guarantee you that person didn't wake up that morning and was like, hey, what do you think I'll do today? It was a result of a lot of wrong thinking. And where your life is today is the result of a lot of good or bad thinking. But the Bible says this, we have the ability to have authority in the thought realm. You are not responsible for the thought that comes your way, but you are responsible with what you do with that thought. We'll get to that in a moment. So, so have you ever just had crazy thoughts? You ever walked into the bank, you're standing in line, and you, you see the bank security guard? He's like 12 years old, and you're like, I could knock him out, jump over the counter, and get that bag of money, and be out of here. You're at the mall, you're in the store, and you see the, I'm sorry if you're mall security, but you see the mall security guy, and you're like, ain't no way this guy's going to catch me. 
So, so you're not responsible for the crazy thoughts, but you are responsible for whether you keep them or whether you leave them or you let them go. So it's very possible that you love Jesus and you're saved and you have some thoughts that aren't the best. Because that's in your old nature. But the Bible says we change this thinking by the word of God. But if we are irresponsible to those thoughts, the devil thrives in areas where we're irresponsible. Number two, wrong thinking or feeling opens the door to the devil. So if the devil's under your feet, and we shouted about that last week, we have authority over his power, why is it sometimes that it feels like we don't have authority, and it would be this, because our wrong thinking or our wrong feeling actually gives them access, you may have left a door unlocked like I did in that truck. And we can feel violated, and we can feel angry, and we can feel frustrated, but we can step back and say, I left it unlocked. And I probably shouldn't say this because this is live stream, but there have been too many mornings where I cannot find my keys. It's, it's an ongoing thing. I actually have a little thing where I can push now and my keys beep, right? Because it happens all the time. But I've, I've just walked outside to my, to my vehicle and realized that, guess where the keys are? Right where I left them, in the ignition. I have actually walked outside and my door be wide open before. Um, so if something's missing in my car, that's going to be one of you guys. <laughs> but think about, I left there, I left access. And I thank God no one's ever went joyriding or stolen it or something like that. But, but, but think about how many times have we left access open? You know, if... if, if um, if the tailgate or the back window of my vehicle is open, it, it will say access open. In other words, there's access somewhere. And, and sometimes the things we're dealing with is because we, left, we have left an access door open somewhere in our life. And so we're going to learn this morning about how to begin to close that. I just want to read, reference some scriptures. Just listen to these. I'm not going to put these on the screen. Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd. He restores my soul. Ephesians says, be restored in the spirit of your mind. Joshua 1.8 says, meditate on these, meditate on the word and it will bring you great success. Isaiah 26.3 says, keep your mind stayed on him and you're going to have this perfect peace. Philippians says, whatever is true and noble and just and pure and lovely, a good report, virtue, praiseworthy, meditate on these and you will have perfect peace. So these, these words like restored, renovated, rescued, recovered, reversed, these are all things that the Word of God can do in our lives. They can renovate. Put it this way, if, if, if a lot of people will flip a house, which means you take a house that wasn't worth a lot, you went in, you flipped it, you restored it, you remodeled it, you knocked some walls out, you put some fresh paint up, you gave it out once over, and then you flip a house and you sell it and you make profit. This is what the Bible is saying. God wants to flip our house. He wants to flip our thinking. He can go in, knock some walls out, do some renovating, slap some new stuff up, change things. And if he changes that, he changes its value and he changes the outcome. So we have authority in this area of our thoughts, but we have to take that responsibility. Yeah. So the devil has access when we are irresponsible in those areas. And, and the last point, letter C, is this. And I love this. The word of God puts the devil in place. Amen. Did y'all hear that? The word puts the devil in his place. So if he is symbolically under our feet because he's under the feet of Jesus, what gives him access is our stinking thinking. What gives them access when we leave an access and we're not taking authority in the, in the realm of the soul, the mind, will, and emotions, or the thoughts, gives access, and if he gets access, he thrives in an environment where he has access. So as believers, we've often given him access, and I'm not saying it's just a simple thing. It's often complicated, and it doesn't happen overnight, but we can give him areas of our life, and we give him permission to be in areas where God said, I've given you authority in those areas. So how do we take that authority? How do we, really what God's called us to do is enforce the authority given to us. If I tossed you my car, if I tossed you these keys, which are to this building, you would immediately be what, responsible 
to lock up, turn the lights off, shut the sound down, whatever came with that. It, it would permit you access, but it would also permit you what? Responsibility. If I toss you the keys to my house, it would be me saying, hey, you got access to my house, my fridge, whatever's there, but you're responsible. And that's what God is saying. That's what authority is. Yes, position is one key, but responsibility is another key. Like you would not just let any uh, crazy person, any wild animal come ravaging into your yard or into your house if you have young kids, right? You wouldn't do that. You would be on guard. But yet that's sort of what happens. The only thing is the devil doesn't come. He's like a roaring lion, but he's not a roaring lion. He's like a roaring lion. So what the devil wants to do is he has to uh, deceive you to disarm you. The devil's after the word of God in your life. But, the, but he, because this, the word of God puts him what? In place. Let, let, let's read a scripture, and it's one that everybody knows. James 22, we always read James 22, but I want to connect it to the verse before it to keep it in context. Verse 21, look what it says. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and all an overflow of wickedness. We don't have a problem with that, right? Okay, but look what it says. And receive with meekness the implanted word that will save your what? Okay, we'll come back to it. Verse 22. But be a doer of the word, not just a hearer only, because then you deceive yourself. We like that verse, but when you connect it to the verse before it, what's it saying? Well, it's very simply saying this. It's up to us to receive the implanted word Another translation is the engrafted word. What is implant or engraft? Here's what that means in the Greek. It means something that takes root and changes growth or, or creates growth or change. Takes root, creates growth or change. So what it's saying is receive the word of God. It'll take root in you. And it'll cause growth and it will cause change. The only thing that can change your stinking thinking now, your spiritual condition's changed, but what elevates our life and are the promises of God? What, what, what creates the authority, the exercise the authority, enforce the authority? It's when we receive with meekness the engrafted word of God. Let it take root. It'll change, and it'll create growth. And if that happens, look at the promise. It will save your soul. Not your spirit, you're saved. It will save your what? Your so that tells me your spirit's saved, but your soul needs the continual process of being what? Saved, remodeled, restored. Actually, here's what that word saved means. It, it, it means this. Delivered, protected, healed, preserved, made well, and made whole. It takes the word of God to make your soul well. Because we have crazy, we can be uh, offended, we could be depressed, we could be hurt, we could be injured, we could be sick, we could have all these things. But it's the word of Jesus that changes our stinking thing. And how? It takes root and it just changes things. It can break your addiction. It can break your depression. It can break your disease. It's getting our life lined up with what Jesus said, and it's an ongoing process, and it's an ongoing habit of laying down and, and yielding to him and receiving the word. We should, always, we should always be able to ask this question, yes, but what does the word say? You may have a bad morning, a bad day, a, a, an attack against you, even just in your thoughts. You may have made some mistakes. You may have all this stuff coming at you, and we have to continue to stop and say, yes, but what does Jesus say? You may feel like the biggest loser one morning, and you need to go to the Word and say, but what did Jesus say? Your body may be uh, in some sickness, but you have to go and say, but what did Jesus say? Put the devil in his place. And then the Bible goes on, and it actually says this. It says, then, don't just hear it, do it. We'll talk about the doing next week. But it's always connected to this receiving the Word with meekness, receiving what Jesus said. So let's talk for a moment. I'll, I'll end with a scripture. Let's talk about some stuff. Um, I, I believe 100% that this is accurate. As a believer, you cannot be possessed by the devil. You cannot. Anybody that's ever said that, they're wrong. Because the spirit of God and the devil can't dwell in the same place. That's why you were born again. Now, a believer can be oppressed, and a believer can be obsessed. Here, here's what I mean by that. Your mind can be oppressed. That means pressure, thoughts, pressure from the devil, and it could be obsessed. 
you could have become obsessed with wrong thinking. What people end up doing is always a result of how they felt. And how they felt is always a result of what they were thinking on. Matter of fact, this, this is a startling statistic. Uh, I read this recently. 70 to 80% of people who are institutionalized for behavioral issues are often there because they believe they've committed an unpardonable sin. And God has turned them over to a reprobate mind and left them. 70 to 80% of people in an institution are there because they feel that. And, and that's, obviously everyone's situation is different, you can't, but most of the time, people have thought on that, and the devil's gotten involved and deceived them, and it's not even true. I've dealt with people in that situation, I've looked them in the face, and I've directed toward it, and I've prayed over them, took the authority over them, and I've watched them change and come out of that environment because they believed a lie, they were in bondage. Now that's a physical bond, I mean that's a locality, bond. but what about some areas of our life that could be bondage? You could be obsessed with some things, some hurt, some offense, you could be obsessed with some wrong thinking, depression, sickness, whatever it might be. If it's not what Jesus said, it does not have to stay. It needs flipped. Yeah. Are y'all getting this? Because you're really quiet. I don't know if you're like, eh, I don't know about, or if you're just taking it, are you taking it in? Yeah. I, did, I did pray for receiving ears, didn't I? Okay. I'm going to pray for some amening mouths. Okay, so, uh, so we, 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 we get to this place where we're just thinking wrong. And whatever we yield to will determine the degree of the devil's influence in our lives. What we yield to, we serve. How, how about this one? Fear. Some people make a mistake and they say this, well, just this, I just have so much, this emotional fear. It's an emotional. Here, here, here's why that's not true. The Bible said, I didn't give you a spirit of fear, but of peace, love, and a sound mind. So it's not an emotion. It's actually a what? Spirit. But you believe it's just part of your nature. You believe it's just part of your emotional makeup, and you've allowed fear. And there's probably an access point somewhere where the devil got fear. This is why I say we got to keep asking ourselves, what did Jesus say in here about these things? Because the Bible says this, every promise that's in here, it's yes and amen. But the devil will try to deceive you to talk you out of the promises of God. You don't feel you're good enough. It's not for you. It's not that. You're not this. It's not working for you. Not going to work. Not going to break through. Not gonna, and he, 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 here's the deal. The Bible says the devil is the father of all lies. He's a great deceiver. That's how he works. Now, he can't come up and be like, lie, 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 but he will deceive you, usually through the realm of your feelings and your thoughts, to get the word from you. So you can see Jesus said it, but I don't feel it. Well, your feelings need to follow your faith. You don't need to let your faith follow your feelings. So, Pastor, if I'm getting this right, you're saying a lot of this comes down to my thoughts. That's exactly what I'm saying. But we've made it about our feelings because the devil works in the five senses and he'll work in the realm of feeling. Now, I'm not saying they're not right or that they're not real. I'm just saying they're not always right. But see, the Spirit of God works in a sixth sense that a non-believer doesn't have. It's called the faith sense. It's when you reach into the promises of God and you grab a promise and then though it may not be seen in your life, you begin to declare it because Jesus said so, and you keep declaring it, and you keep declaring it, and you keep prophesying it, and you keep declaring it to your life. And if you know there are some areas of your life that don't line up with what Jesus said, don't start stroking those feelings. Look in the mirror and say, but this is what God said. Everything that says you can't, you look and say, well, he said I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Every time you're feeling the sadness and depression, and it, 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 I'm not saying just a bad day. I'm saying if it's a season, you need to look in the mirror and say, this is what God said. I'm going to believe what God said. What did Jesus say? I'm telling you, I have seen in people's lives addictions break. I've seen the bondage of depression break. I've seen suicidal thoughts break. I've seen people change. I've seen them go from sad to joy. And what it took was getting in the Word. I've seen it happen in my own life. Habits, things that will break because of the Word of God. 
Now, if you really feel like maybe, maybe you're in a season where you're overwhelmed and your mind's overwhelmed and it's obsessed, uh, I would encourage you with this. Go and see what the word says, number one. And two, you may need to talk to somebody. But let me say this to you. You need to talk to not just somebody, but a faith somebody. Because see, there's some people you talk to, they'll get right down in the ditch with you and say, oh, you're right, it's bad, but my situation was worse than this. And well, I know there's a God, but we're just holding on to Jesus comes. And I, I don't know that, you know, that, that church, that, that's a word preacher. It's a word church. Yeah. Because it's what will save your soul. So I'm saying if you're going to talk to somebody, make sure they have faith. If, if, even if you're going to a counselor or a pastor, but if you're sitting in a church under a sermon Sunday after Sunday, you better make sure it's a place of faith. Not let me put a patch on you to figure out how to get through a week, but get, talk, tell you how to get some authority and some victory because that's what Jesus said you're to walk in. But I see too many believers walking around with their heads down, beat up, wondering what Jesus is gonna do. And Jesus said, it's finished. I gave you the keys. I gave, I'm telling you, if you start using these keys, it's like giving you a, a keys to a brand new vehicle and you walk out every day and be like, oh, the glory of this vehicle. Ooh, praise the Lord. That baby's sweet. That's a fresh ride. Look at him rims. Oh, the stereo. I can just imagine what that, I bet it's, you, oh, it's pretty. Look at pretty. That's nice. Praise you, Lord. Thank you for this blessing. And you never sat down in it. You never put the keys in it. And you never started it up. But it's pretty. It's, praise the Lord. <laughs> You've been talking about it, but you don't know what it's like. You're not walking in authority. Until somebody opened the door and they said, get in. Now put the keys in there. Oh, I couldn't. I couldn't do that. Yes, you could. I, you need to. Yeah. Just, just sit down. Oh, this is not. Yeah, it's started. I couldn't. Yeah, start it up. Oh, this sounds nice. Take it for a spin. Oh, no, it's too nice. Too nice. Come on. I, know, I don't even know where that came from. That was silly. <laughs> But that's how some of us believers are. We're looking at the word. We're thanking Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Praise the Lord. Yeah. We forgot we're living from the throne. Yeah. Now, now, come on. The cross was a place of defeat. The throne is a, is a, is a place of victory. Can I give you another scripture? I got, I got to hurry. I got to hurry. Second Corinthians. I know you know this, but years ago, there was so much messed up in spiritual warfare People would get in planes and fly over cities and call down spirits. And, and the devil has a lease in those places. There's ways to do that the right way. But, but I want you to get this scripture because this is talking about what I'm talking about today. The weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, but they're mighty in God. And they pull down strongholds. A stronghold is just something you can't get rid of, a thought over and over. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Anything that exalts itself in opposition to what Jesus said the Bible said it's an argument. It's an imagination. And it says, bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. What, what that means is, let me give you the Greek word there. It's the word interrogate. Bring everything that's coming at you under interrogation. Y'all have seen the movies. You know, when they put, I, I'm in this um, FBI Academy, and I, I sat this one, one, one night with a, a guy who interrogates. And it was a little bit different than TV. Actually, everything's been a little bit different than TV. And so they say they'll just spend hours interrogating, and they're just patient because eventually the person will break, and they'll say something. Eventually, the devil's going to break his hold on you. You keep putting those things under the interrogation of the word. If it's, if it's a thought, if it's a habit, if it's a feeling, if it's something that Jesus didn't say, and it might have been there for years, you keep putting it under the interrogation of the word, and he'll have to let his hands off of it because the Bible said when you know the truth, the truth's gonna do what? Set you free. And we shout about freedom, but are we walking in it? We gotta keep exposing ourselves to the truth, not how we feel. Not how we feel. The devil's biggest goal was to get you sidetracked. You know, when World War II ended, there's stories 
it, out in the oceans and on islands where the Japanese continued to fight for a year up to two years because nobody told them the battle was over. And if you're a believer, I got a word for you. Jesus said on the cross, y'all, it's over. He didn't want you fighting in these areas. He just wants you to stand in them, declare them, stand in your faith. That's the fighting you have to do right there. Now, let, let, let me ask you a, a couple of, of questions. See, the devil has to deceive you to get you sidetracked. So I want to ask you a couple of real questions. I did this last service, and, and i got to move on. How many of you would say over the last few weeks you have been under unusual discouragement? If that's you, stand to your feet. Unusual. Not you had a bad hair day, but it's unusual discouragement. Anybody the last few weeks been un, under an unusual fear? If that's you, stand. I asked this to our team the other day, and almost everybody was standing. And so I'll say this to you. Um, there are times we can look and say, I gave the devil a door. I see it. And then there are times maybe we didn't see it coming, and it came on us, and it's there. And what the devil wants to do is talk you out of your promise and talk you out of your blessing. And he wants to talk you out of it. He has to deceive you to talk you out of it. So here's the deal. Those times are the strongest, either A, right before a breakthrough, or B, right after a breakthrough. So if you just went through a big breakthrough, it's not uncommon that the enemy would try to detour you after Jesus did something big. You say, well, I didn't really have a big breakthrough, so that what that tells me that it's on the way, and the devil's trying to intercept it and distract you and detour you. And the second thing I would say to you is sometimes these attacks come in seasons. They come in seasons. And I would tell you that this season right now, I'm not going to go into a lot of this. It's going to sound a little creepy, but, um, you know, we're, we're, we're in a month where those in the realm of darkness believe that the layer between darkness and light and dead and living is at its thinnest. They call it All Hallows' Eve. That's Halloween. Um, I, I don't have time to go into all of it, but, but that's that to, to, to the powers of darkness, that's our Good Friday. That's our Easter. It's often not strange that this is a season that you're dealing with some of those things. I'm gonna go, we don't have time to go off on that, but I'm just saying to you that just because you're in a challenge does not mean you're going to lose. Every challenge is an opportunity for a champion. But I will say that there are times when the devil comes, and, and if, if, I said this before, but if you're just shaking your head like, I, man, this is just... See, here's what I've learned. There are times you can see where, there's, where you've given in, opened the door. There's times of t uh, attack. And if that's the case, you just say, God, I repent, change your mind. He gets you right back. But then there, when there are times you just shake your head. Be like, I don't get it. That's a spiritual attack. I've been through times where I'm just like, don't make no sense. It's a spiritual attack. Now, not the times Aaron got himself into attack, but the times when it was just coming. Matter of fact, I, I'll, I'll let you in on this. It, and my wife can back me up on this. Um, last week, I just went through a mental torment for days. I was ready to quit. You ask her. Uh, and I didn't, obviously. And I'm speaking. I'm standing on some things. And she said, what are you talking about Sunday? I said, I'm talking about authority over the devil. She said, he doesn't want you to preach that. I said, well, that makes sense. So we preached last week. It was good, wasn't it? So last night, I go to bed. The reason why this stool is here is because I went to bed last night. I was fine. I woke up. I couldn't see straight. The room was going like this. I'm like, well, I must have swept, slept wrong. <laughs> so I get up. I can't even walk across the room this morning. I'm falling over things. I'm laying against the wall in the shower. Everything is doing this. She says, well, what are we going to do? I said, well, you're either going to preach my notes or we're just going to get through it. And so I walked up here first service and everything is doing this. Um, and, and that's why this was here. I can't stay sitting on it, but I tried. And she said, what are you preaching on? I said, authority, your responsibility, authority over your thought realm. She said, the devil doesn't want you to preach it. Now, just because I don't feel bad doesn't always mean it's the devil. But in this case, I believe it's true. My point is, as much as he didn't want me to preach it, he didn't want you to hear it. I got one more to go. And if, if they have to drag me home 
and throw me in the bed. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna preach it because I want you to hear it. It's a game changer. It's a game changer. Let's all stand. Let's all stand.